Please stand and join me for the call to worship. We come with joy to this celebration of God's love. Open our hearts, Lord, to receive your love. We come with hope to this witness to God's power. Challenge and encourage our spirits to serve you, Lord. We come with a willingness to proclaim God's presence to all. We thank God for this invitation to worship, to witness, and serve. Amen. you've joined us here at worship at Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We know that there are some of you here in the building today and we thank you for making the effort to be here in this COVID time. And we know most of our congregation is online with us this morning and we welcome you as well and we're glad that you've chosen to worship with us in all the ways that we can. Turn and look at your neighbor, whoever you're worshiping with today and say, the peace of Christ be with you.
please join me in reading the prayer of confession. It's in, on the screens and in your worship guide. Awesome God, you have made all of creation and each cell of our bodies. You know our thoughts and you know our sins. We try desperately to hide our mistakes, our weaknesses, our embarrassments, but you know it all. And so we come before you now asking for your forgiveness, even as you know the limits of our human capabilities. We know the unlimited power of your love. Forgive us, cleanse us, make us whole. Let us continue our prayer in silence. The God who has, who has made us will never desert us. The God of creation is creating still, making us new. The God whose love gave us the gift of Jesus Christ is the same God whose love forgives us and sustains us. And let all God's people say together, amen. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you.
conversation that I had with another co-worker. So we were talking about how crazy it is to quite frankly just be alive right now and we talked about how there's sort of this decision tree that you have to go through every day. So I made an example and this says COVID decision tree. All right and so you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is you go hmm how do I feel today? Do I feel good? And if so you go or do I feel kind of bad? And then you go, hmm, how bad do I feel? Do I have a fever? If I have a fever and I am having some symptoms, is there any testing available for me? Do I need to isolate? What about my kids? Do my kids have fevers? Do they feel okay? Should I be sending them to school or not? Should I be sending them to daycare? What are the rules at school and daycare? You see what I mean. And then even if you feel great, you think, hmm, do I go to work today? Do I work from home today? Um, do I need to run errands if I'm running errands? Where do I need to go? And uh, is there a mask requirement? Am I going to wear a mask whether there's a requirement or not? Am I going to feel weird if other people aren't wearing masks? These are all of the things that are going through everybody's mind all the time. And even though I sound a little bit funny right now, it's not funny at all. People are exhausted. Lots of people are exhausted. So what do we do about it? I have talked before about throwing kindness around like it's confetti. And so I built a kindness basket. And here it is. And this is something that you could easily do at home as well. So my kindness basket has in it stickers and paper and more stickers and crayons, and these would be great things to just have around when you're sitting in the evening with your kids. And you can make cards for people. And then I started thinking about our teachers. Boy, if you want to talk about an exhausted set of folks, teachers, healthcare workers, we keep hearing about it, but it hasn't stopped for them, it hasn't let up. So what could we do? Let me show you a few things. I found these fun little cards on Pinterest, okay? So, for example, this one says, we love your commitment to being a great teacher. You could pair that with some mints or some gum. This one says, 
bursting to tell you you're an amazing teacher. Microwave popcorn would be a fun thing to put in there because it bursts. Anyway, there's all sorts of stuff like this that you could do for the teachers in your life, whether they're friends of yours or whether they're your kids' teachers. Um, have fun with it. Go online, there's all sorts of stuff. But the bottom line is, last week I talked about walking with one another as part of beloved community through the challenges in our lives. And so this week I'm saying we are all tired. We're all that vulnerable person right now. Let's walk with one another and let's share loving kindness, light glitter, everywhere that we go. Have a great week. Bye-bye. I'm glad we can worship together when it's hard because we need one another. So fill out your welcome sheets if you're in worship today and you've put them in the baskets as you leave. And if you're online, please go on to the welcome pad and let us know that you're with us. Why do we ask you to do that? Because we want to keep track of our congregation, make sure everyone's connected. We want to pray for you. So please let us know that you're with us. And if you have prayer concerns, please let us know those as well. We care about you. We want you to be included. Today is the day for entry point. If you've been thinking about joining Hennepin, we're going to be on Zoom. So go onto the website and go to the events page. You'll find the Zoom link for our entry point. If you're interested in joining, I'll meet you there on Zoom and we'll talk all about Hennepin and what it can mean in your life. And you can ask all the questions you might be holding inside your heart as you're deciding whether this might be the place where God has called you to put down some spiritual roots. I hope you'll join me at 1130 today for that wonderful step forward. There's a wonderful art exhibit that is in Carlson Hall today. And if you're online, you're going to want to drive over sometime this week and check it out. It's called Art from the Inside. And it's an art gallery expression of transformation. It is art that has been created by people who are incarcerated in Minnesota from the Shakopee Prison and also Stillwater. It's amazing and you'll want to see it. It is in Carlson Hall as you come in off the parking lot on East Entry. You can come right into Carlson Hall and spend as much time as you like with these pieces of art. Your life will be inspired. Please note a couple changes. Our youth ministry has gone all online now, so make sure if you have youth in your circle of influence and in your family, make sure you check out our youth newsletter online so that you can keep up with what's going on and you can connect in that way. Our children's ministry is also online. There are all kinds of things happening, but you need to keep track of them through the children's ministry newsletter. You can access that on our online. It's haunc.org. Next Sunday, we will have a church conference to approve the 2022 budget. It will be immediately following worship here in the sanctuary at 1115, and you will be able to access that meeting on Zoom as well, and the links will be on our website under the events section. We are invited to come and be a part of that meeting, and you can come and vote and to approve the budget. It is at 1115, January 30th, in the sanctuary and online and Zoom. All of the other events that are happening, and there are many, and there are too many to announce, please check out the website so you can stay current and be involved in your church. We want to know you, and others want to know you as well. So let's do that together. Now, let's open up our hearts and get ready to hear the word of God through the letters of Paul to the Philippians as Carol reads our scripture for today. This morning's scripture is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, verses 2 through 12 of chapter 1. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. 
For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks to our communications team that made such a beautiful video to remind us that we are a church that seeks to be courageous in these difficult times. Courage. What does it take to live with courage? Today we're talking about courage, the courage it takes to offer grace. When I think of courageous grace, I think of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he comes to my mind, and he would have, even if it hadn't been MLK weekend as we celebrate his birthday tomorrow. King said this about courage. Courage is an inner resolution to go forward despite obstacles. Cowardice is submissive surrender to circumstances. Courage breeds creativity. Cowardice represses fear and is mastered by it. Cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it polite? Is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when we must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but one must take it because it is right. King fought for civil rights. We know this. He moved to end segregation and he fought for voting rights and for equality. He pushed for a poor people's campaign because he did have a dream that there would be a time when all of us would live in beloved community, not just in words but in actions as people have all that they need in this land of plenty. He called us to operate out of love instead of hate, where we recognize our interdependence and where nonviolent resistance is the way to make change. King lived and died with courage, but also with an incredible grace, because he refused to give in to hate, resentment, and revenge. When people spat on him, as they did, kicked him, arrested him, put him in jail, resisted the t he resisted the temptation to respond with hatred, with resentment, or the temptation to call the movement that he led into violence. He urged others to continue to resist with nonviolent ways. This is at the heart of courageous grace. Courageous grace does not mean being quiet or even polite in the face of injustice. But it does mean that we will not give up 
on either the people who suffer injustice, those who live on the margins, or on those who perpetrate unjust systems. As I watched the news this week and heard the wrangling over COVID vaccinations, testing and school closings, and the sparring that went on and continues in Washington, D.C. about voting rights, about the January 6th insurrection investigation, I thought we could use more courageous grace in our country today. I couldn't help but think, what would it take for us in the church to be leaders in this movement of courage and conviction that makes change but at the same time offers grace to one another as King did, as John Lewis did, even as we fight with passion for justice and equality for all. How can we remain deeply committed to our convictions, our values and resolve, but also be committed to work together to listen to one another in order to make those changes so that we can solve problems instead of just yelling and demonizing whoever we believe is in the opposition? How can each one of us live with courageous grace that really moves our lives forward, our relationships forward, and our nation forward? The skeptics among us, and I must admit that I become one every so often, may wonder if gracious courage is even possible. The world has changed, we tell one another. It may seem like a nice idea, but too impractical in these times when our nation and world are so deeply divided about so many things. And yet, even as we are so divided, we cannot, we cannot escape the reality that we must share this earth with people we like and people we don't. People with whom we share common values and people with whom we do not. And the truth is, if we're going to survive and thrive on this tiny little globe, we are going to have to find a way to get along better. You may remember the old song, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. Well, it is still true today. And that love is going to have to be courageous because it won't be easy. It is never easy. It has never been easy to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. It always requires lots of courageous grace. But you may be thinking and asking yourself, well, what is grace? John Stott says grace is love that cares and stoops and rescues. Paul Zoll says grace is unconditional love toward a person who does not deserve it. Richard Rohr says, grace is what God does to keep all things God has made in love and alive forever. When the Apostle Paul writes his letter to the Philippians thanking God for his faith community, did you notice that he gives thanks for the grace they share? It's easy to offer grace to people like we like, people who are likely to offer grace back to us in return. At least most of the time it's easy. Although if we asked our family members, and I have two of them here today, you can check this out, they may say it's not always so easy to offer grace. But we keep trying. But what about sharing grace with people who drive us crazy? The ones who get on our nerves. The ones who disappoint us. The ones who make decisions we didn't like. What about the people who are rude and thoughtless or didn't follow good process? Those who are controlling, or at least we think they are. What about people who voted differently from you? Or people who betrayed you? Or what about offering grace to people who don't agree with when we talk about vaccination and school closures? Went to the Mall of America yesterday to do some walking. I put my heaviest mask on and walked fast and didn't stay long. But I found inside of me this anger every time I saw people with their mouths hanging out, no masks, and I thought, how could I offer grace? They were really bugging me. I could feel that resentment rising up in my throat. Do you ever have that? What about offering grace to parents who disagree about which books should be in our school libraries? 
People who are afraid to talk about racism because it might hurt their children, they think. Or what about offering grace to people who don't see eye to eye about marriage equality or racism? How, how, about, how are we going to share the grace of God with people whom we strongly disagree? But that's our calling, friends. And let's just be honest. It's hard to offer grace to people we don't believe that deserve it. But remember this. Grace isn't earned. It is unmerited love. And God shows us an amazing and confounding and radical grace by loving us when we make God crazy. And we do. God loves us even when we are misinformed, even when we spread false information, even when we fail to love our neighbors, even when we refuse to listen. Can we love like that? Can we love like God? A generous, abiding, amazing, confounding, and maybe even irritating grace. Imagine what the conversation would be like if we were more respectful, if we were more willing to listen and disagree without tearing each other apart. What would our relationships really be like if we were really serious about following Jesus' example? Who said on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What would it look like in this world if we could love like that? Well, it would take courage because radical grace isn't the way of the world, but it is the way of God. And it is possible with the help of God. People who trust God to guide us as we experience God's grace every day because we are able to offer grace when we know that we have been offered grace. And when we stay so focused on that and as we stay centered on that, some pretty amazing and courageous things can happen when we live in the midst of that courageous grace. Well, what will it take for us to muster that kind of courage? What will it take for us to stay on track? Well, surely it takes faith and it takes trust in God to lead the way. But there are some things that get in our way quite regularly and I think that one of those things is grief. Grief that turns to anger, resentment, and fear. I was talking with a wise friend this week, and we were talking about grief. Grief in the church. Grief in our community. Grief in our families. Grief in our congregation. How can we work through our grief? This wonderful friend who wishes to remain anonymous, remind me that one way we can work through our grief is to ask ourselves three questions. What have we lost? What do we have? And how will we move forward? It occurred to me that the Apostle Paul must have done some of this inner work as he wrote his letter to the Philippians so he could lead them with grace and courage. Sometimes we forget that life wasn't easy for the Apostle Paul. He was writing this letter to the Philippians from prison. And I wonder if Paul asked himself, what have I lost? There he was in chains. And he had lost his ability to move about freely. He was quarantined, so to speak. He had lost his ability to be with his community in person. He had lost the ability to break bread with those he loved, to share intimate conversations and he could have pretended that it was no big deal and just soldiered on, put his head down, pretended it wasn't there. He could have used his time in prison to plot his revenge against those who put him there. He could have let his heart grow hard and weary and cold as he nursed his anger and resentment, and it could have turned to hatred. And no one would have blamed him. And he could have allowed himself to slip into self-doubt and self-pity. After all, he had once been called Saul, the Pharisee, and he had persecuted the, persecuted the followers of Jesus' way. He was doing what he thought was right and what was faithful. People's lives had been taken because of his blindness. He had incited violence and insurrection against the followers of the way. Jesus' followers, because he thought he was stomping out a rogue group that was leading people away from the truth. Imagine how he felt when he found out that he was all wrong, 
about what God was up to as he traveled on the road to Damascus when the risen Christ met him there, struck him blind so God could show him the light and make him see. God set him straight with a courageous grace. And after he saw that light, quite literally, he began to start churches. And as we read Paul's writings in the New Testament and his letters, over and over again we see that he is willing to look honestly at his failures, failures, at his grief, but he doesn't get mired there. He moves on to ask the question, yes, I've done all these things, I have failed, I have much to be repentant of, but what do I have? And what does he have? Well, Paul is clear about this. He gets thanks for the grace and the love he has received from God, the forgiveness that was unmerited but poured out so generously from a God who loves us, and he knows he is forgiven. He gets thanks for the community at Philippi who shares in this grace with him. He recognizes that people who offer grace are people who know they have received grace. Remember that. We are all in this together. We have all made mistakes. We all have failures, individual and communal, and we are all in the need of God's grace. We all need forgiveness from one another and from God. Remember this because it's essential when we are working with difficult people, and there are no shortage of those. Paul is clear. The grace that they share is the grace that will move them forward. How will we move forward? We must not stay mired in our grief. We have the grace and the love of God which we share and we have each other as we hold each other in our hearts, as Paul says. Remember that Paul was never a lone ranger. He never walked away from the community to do it alone. Paul was determined to move forward with the community, even as it was flawed. He knows that we cannot offer courageous grace to the world, which is so weary and so needing grace. We must do it together. Paul relies on the community to keep him centered and moving forward, and his courage is born out of sustained support and love of his community. He prays for the community, praying that they will continue to be filled with compassion and wisdom and insight so that whatever they attempt to do to share God's love, all that work of grace and courage which God has begun in us will one day be completed, bringing glory to God, he says. God has already started this work of grace in us and God will bring it to completion through us and it will bring glory to God. I don't know about you, but that keeps me going forward when things look bleak. You see, God is glorified when God's children love each other with mercy and justice. God is glorified when we stand up against racism or anything else that will tear us apart. When we are courageous, all of us, God is able to be glorified as we use our power and our influence and our privilege to raise up the things that bring God's glory. And we are not there yet. We must continue to pray for one another. We must continue to encourage one another and fortify each other as we move forward with faith, hope, and love. We must stick together so that we can be fueled and refueled again and again with compassion and wisdom and insight and courageous grace so that God will be able to bring all of this work to completion. Friends, today as we stand at Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, we know how long the road is. It is hard, and there is stiff resistance to racial justice in our nation today. Senator John Lewis did not see the completion of his work as he worked tirelessly for the right for everyone to vote. But he pressed on to his dying day, and so must we. 
Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did not see his work completed. He did not make it to the promised land with the movement, but he pressed on knowing that the work would continue long after he was gone, and it has, but we still have a long way to go to make racial reconciliation and justice a reality in our world. Clyde Bellancourt, who died this past week, worked tirelessly for justice and equity for Native peoples, and he inspired, inspired many, a new generation of activists. But his work is not yet completed. It must go on, and we must join in this work. We must go on and on and on until the day when all God's children have enough to thrive, when our work, uh, their work is not done yet. Their work is our work now. Their passion for justice and mercy and the vision that all people should experience the courageous grace of God must continue in us and through us. It must be our passion. This is our way forward. Friends, it is so easy and understandable even to let our grief and disappointment, our failures and resentments get in the way to slow us down. But we must continue to ask ourselves, where do we find ourselves right now? What have we lost? The truth today that we must face is that we have lost the ability or many people have lost the ability and desire to listen to people with whom we disagree. Many people have lost the ability to trust their leaders. In our pandemic, a lot of us have lost the illusion that we could live for ourselves doing whatever pleases us without impacting our neighbor's well-being. Some people have lost traditions that have meant a lot to us. We've lost some of the intimacy that was only possible when we gather in person. We've lost the ability to plan with the assurance that our plans will stay firm and in place. Yes, it will continue to take courage to face our grief and our loss with honesty and lots of kindness baskets. But let's not forget what we have. What do we have? We have the love of God who offers us an amazing radical grace. We are forgiven and freed and fueled to be courageous, having our lives being shaped by a courageous grace that makes real change in the world. We have each other. In this community of faith, we can grow and we can draw strength and hope and courage to offer grace to our friends and our enemies when life isn't easy. When we forget we are in need of grace, this community is here to gently but firmly remind us and encourage us that we are not alone. Don't think for a minute that we won't have days when our doubts and our fears and frustrations want to take over. There will always be those days, my friends. But when our hope begins to flag and we grow weary, we can look to this community of faith to remind us and convince us over and over again that God's grace is sufficient, that God's grace is true, and hope is possible. And that will give us the courage to keep on moving forward if we stay centered in that truth. Look, God's grace is always showing up in people who refuse to stop offering courageous grace, even as they are ridiculed, spat on, rejected, and laughed at. Take courage as we see our healthcare workers, our restaurant workers, teachers, school administrators, airline personnel, as they keep showing up to offer grace and courage, even when people pick on them and harass them but they need our prayers. They need our support, our encouragement. And they need us to speak up and speak out on their behalf. Parents who are just plain exhausted. There's an article in the paper about it this morning. They're at their wit's end, 
trying to find childcare that is affordable, helping kids with their school home homework as they distance learn. They are frustrated. They are showing signs of stress. Their children are showing signs of mental stress. They are there in their tears, in their laughter, when they're sick with COVID. Parents are there tending to all of this at the same time, trying to keep their employers happy with their job performance. And they're at a breaking point. But those parents just keep showing up with courageous grace every single day, every single moment. And they need our help, our support, our prayers, and our undying encouragement. I want to thank you for showing up today. This week I met with our lay visitation team and I was inspired. We have people who continue throughout this pandemic to make calls and send notes, telephone calls, checking in on people to make sure that their church, they know that their church loves them and has not forgotten them. You don't have to be on the lay visitation team to pick up the phone and talk to someone you haven't seen for a while that you miss. You don't have to be on the lay visitation team or have permission from the pastors to call on some folks you know are upset about some of the decisions that were made in the last year at Hennepin. Call them. Love them. Remind them that we all need courageous grace. Thank you for showing up, feeding hungry people, both physically and spiritually. Because your support, your love, and your courageous grace makes a difference. So take courage. Don't be afraid. Offer grace whenever and wherever you can, even when it is hard. And when you fail, and we all will, remember that this community holds you in our hearts. Friends, we have good news to share. God's grace is in us, moving among us, and made real through us. I want to close with something that will warm your hearts. In June, Callie Donoff Beardsley came to this congregation as a visitor. And she began to come, and she became a member in June. She sent me a heartwarming message that she wanted to share with you, and I asked her to make a video so that you could hear it from her own words. Take a look. Hey there, Hennepin friends. My name is Callie Donath Beardsley, and I'm new around here. I just started coming in June 2021, and I wanted to share a little bit with you about what brought me here, what I found here, and why I'm excited to be a part of the 2022 Pledge Drive. You see, I'd been out of church since 2006, the year I finished my undergrad. And when I thought of church during 15 years since then, I thought of all the things that I didn't think that church should be, but not really believing it could be anything other than what I'd seen. And then I heard an ad on Minnesota Public Radio about a church involved in the work of anti-racism, a cause that is near and dear to my heart. And I began to wonder and even hope was this a church that really cared about others, that truly welcomed everyone, that elevated the voices of those so often ignored? That church, of course, was Hennepin, and the answers to those questions was a resounding yes. I have found here an audacious love for the people outside these walls and a wellspring of hope for those within. 15 years is a long time to journey on your own, and finding this place was like finding water after crossing a desert. Hennepin friends, I'm here because of you and because of the thousands of people who have come over the years and made their offerings. I'm excited to be a part of the 2022 Pledge Drive, and I hope you'll join me. Even if you don't think it's enough to make a difference, I promise you, it all adds up. Thank you for your generosity, your welcome, and your love.
please be seated. Please bow with me in prayer at this time. God of each new day, and of this day, as we come stumbling into your presence, we are increasingly aware of the ways that we are blessed by your love and surrounded by your goodness. For the beauty of this day, for the beauty of the earth, and for the beauty of our lives that impact our life, we give you thanks and praise. May our awareness of your presence continue to grow as day by day we experience the power of your Holy Spirit moving through our lives and through our actions. Sometimes our words of praise feel half-hearted, O oh God, for there are many troubles facing us today. We are saddened by all too frequent loss of life through random violence and unrestrained emotion. We seek ways to lift up the value of all your children, to help one another to see your face in every human face, to move together into community instead of separating ourselves into self-protective groups. Increase in each of us a determination to build bridges of reconciliation and understanding. May we find new ways to learn from each other and about each other, to walk with each other instead of away from each other. Among those whom we would stand, who would stand together are those who are ill, those who are struggling with disease or depression, with pain or persecution. In this time of prayer, we remember them all, those whose names and situations we know, and the myriad of others only known by you. Healing God, be with all who are hurting, to restore them to wholeness and be with them. Heal them as each one of us carry our own brokenness in ways that others do not notice. We especially remember today the family of Francis Good and the family of Laurie Sturevant, whose father passed away. In these days ahead, we have call, you have called us to reflection and so we pray that you would help us be up to this task. Give us hearts filled with courage that we may not hide from suffering a friend or enemy. Give us shoulders broad enough with strength that we may walk with the wounded. Give us spirits quiet with humility that we may walk forth into new life in your name. So we give you thanks this morning for the church for the company of our siblings in Christ that stretches to all corners of this earth. Empower us to say what we believe, to live what we profess, so that people everywhere will come to know your great love for them. And enable us to know and celebrate that same love in, your life, in our lives in the days and weeks ahead. So may our witness to Jesus Christ begin as we join our voices to pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our God, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn.
friends, um, Callie forgot to mention, if you want to give this morning, you can drop your offerings in the offering plates and the, as you leave the room, or you can give online this morning. Thank you for being here today. Remember that next Sunday in the building, we will have Copper Street Brass, our resident artists. They will be here to play and lead us in worship next week. Friends, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord our God is with us wherever we go. So go and offer with courage the grace that has been given to us. The love that has been poured into us through God, through the Holy Spirit. Empowering us to be the church that brings hope and light and love into the world. Go and share it generously. And may the peace of Christ be with you all. Amen.